Welcome. Stomon House is a special school and we take secondary students who wouldn't thrive at a mainstream secondary. So usually they've been at mainstream primary schools where they can have a wide range of needs, but they'll all be working within the national curriculum somewhere, but they might have speech language and communication needs, some learning difficulties, some social communication difficulties, perhaps some medical needs are compounding some of their, their loss of learning, the relationships with other students might be getting a bit stretched or a bit thin, and um, developmentally they might appear younger than they are. Um, but there's a very wide range of needs in the school and we've got a very uh, handy guide which you can download from our website that talks about the range of needs. I think it's important to say that because we're a special school, we specialise. We don't meet every type of special education need. There's no special school that does. So it, it's important that uh, any parent or professional that is thinking about you know, us as a possible school has a look at the range of needs we meet and you, know, you will know best the, the, the needs of the young person that you're uh, trying to find a school for and uh, see if they match up. But when uh, parents and carers have to uh, fill in the forms about secondary transfer, it's a very stressful time and I appreciate that. So, it's important for us to be clear about um, where our students generally are when, when we make that decision. So we would expect students to uh, be on the national curriculum, some of them might be working within the year one expectations, some of them might be higher than that. Occasionally we have some working at perhaps year three, even year four, but there'll be other difficulties that may mean that mainstream secondary isn't going to work for the young person. If somebody uh, hasn't yet mastered you know, the early learning goals or the expectations that you would have coming out of reception, then we're not a good match for those needs. I'd rather be straight about that um, than, than waste people's time. Uh, we have a secondary model curriculum, we do differentiate it to the, le the level that students are at when, when they arrive and when they work through the school, but they're going to need to um, negotiate a secondary curriculum. They will be leaving here with accreditation and making decisions about their, their future. A lot of you, that might seem a long way off, but that, that's what we're here for and that's what we specialise in. Um, sometimes I get asked, well, what if my child is outside that range of needs. Well, of course, we have to make an individual response when we're consulted on any child about whether or not we can meet their needs. And um, we have to take everything into consideration before making that response. But if we've got somebody whose um, learning needs are very significant and across the board and for whom a secondary model curriculum isn't going to really make sense, we wouldn't be a good match. However, it might be that somebody's got, um, they might have some difficulties in many areas, but particularly you know, with the reading, writing, spelling, the, the maths work that is really getting in, in the way of how they learn in other areas, Quite often our students will be aware enough of where they are with their learning for school not to be feeling as positive as it used to. So um, if we have a young person with a, with a particular medical need, of course we will look at that. There are, there are a range of medical needs at the school. There is nobody here because of their medical need itself. It will be because of the impact on their learning, their confidence as a learner, um, their, their emotional
emotional vulnerability as well as the, the physical effects of that medical condition. Uh, I'm sure that's the case in very many schools. Uh, because we're a small school, obviously we can be more uh, individualised in, in our understanding and response to uh, young people's medical needs or their emotional needs, but um, there still is a curriculum to work our way through that we will differentiate and support that young person, but also challenge them so that they're uh, achieving at a higher level than perhaps some other people might have expected along the way. School dinners can be um, a real issue for some young people and uh, we regard what happens at lunchtime as being a very valuable part of the education process. We've got a chef educator working in the school who prepares fresh, fantastic meals. Um, but it's not just the quality of the food that's important, it's the socialisation around it. We have some students that uh, have got you know, dietitian advice or psychological or psychiatric advice or uh, they may have phobias, they may have uh, obsessional routines uh, around food and our job is not just to accommodate those but to move them to a position where that young person is more able to navigate the rest of the world so that you know if they go off on work experience we don't want the to be going fine until it comes to the time to eat we want them to have the confidence and skills to be able to um, really not stand out in a negative way but to kind of cope socially and to be able to adapt and respond if the situation isn't quite the way they would like it to be so, so learning to um, eat with other people, to have that communal experience and to um, not have any uh, stress around it and, and, to, and obviously to be nourished, um, they're all really important things. So we, we will work there, but, but so it's important to say that we don't uh, have pack lunches coming to the school partly around the issue of uh, allergies and so on, but really about that issue of um, socialisation. We don't have a canteen where students, if you like, pay for things. You either have a free school meal or you buy your, your free school meal, but that's taken care of the office. Everybody in the dining room is there on an equal footing. And it, it's that whole experience that's very important. Also, it allows us to use uh, celebratory events or, you know, that include food as something that all students are already familiar and comfortable with you know, around events like Christmas or we, we might have um, meal days that tie into particular you know, cultural events. All of that is a really part, important part of belonging and so uh, it's an important part of education. In normal circumstances, we do run after school clubs, but we don't have uh, an external child mining facility working at the school. Uh, the, the numbers aren't big enough for, for them to run, so that is an important factor. Um, we do generally run clubs on Monday, Wednesday and Thursday after school. In the current circumstances, we're, we're trying to look at how we can run those because the organisation that we've been using to help us do that has actually gone bust. So we need to work our way safely back towards that. So there are after school clubs. If your child is on transport, then that's a, a different question I know, but if they're on transport, transport leaves the school at, at a fixed time. So if they were to attend a club, they need to be collected unless they're already capable of travelling independently. Students here do follow the national curriculum as part of our curriculum. Our curriculum is actually broader, richer and deeper than the requirements of the national curriculum. But they follow the national curriculum that's appropriate to where they are at their stage of learning and development. So, we may need to take the subjects and the topics within the secondary curriculum and pitch them at the right level 
with just the right amount of challenge for uh, all of our students. So we're, what we're trying to do with the curriculum is uh, assess where students are, where their gaps in their learning are, address those gaps, but also open up the richness of the curriculum so that young people can discover their talents as well as have their needs met, if I can put it that way. As our students progress through the school, they find things that they're passionately excited about and interested in, even if, or perhaps because, of the challenge involved. Some, for some of them that might be poetry or a particular sort of maths, but for others it might be music, art and design, sport, all areas of achievement that they might well have actually not been doing much of in primary school because of, of the needing to focus on literacy and numeracy. So it's a rich, broad and deep curriculum that includes the national curriculum. So, big question is, do students do exams? What kind of exams do they do? Some of our students will take GCSEs. Others will take entry level qualifications at the age of 16. Most will take a mixture of both. The actual uh, exams that we offer do change over time because we need to keep matching what is available to match that to the needs of our young person. You know, year 9 one year and the year 9 class one year won't be the same as a year 9 class the following year. You know, the, 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 where they are with their learning it, it is the sum of all the individual attainments in their class and we need to match that, not just assume that everybody can reach a particular level at a particular age. But we're here to stretch young people. Um, exams and other accreditation are the only measure of a high quality education, but they are the passport onto future success and so we want to equip our students for success therefore they will take accreditation in many subjects English, Maths, Art and Design, Design Technology, Food Technology, Computing, Science, Sport, Personal and Social Development, smaller qualifications in RE, Geography and History, all of those are available. It's a very wide range of accreditation. Our aim is for students to make more rapid progress here than they had done previously or they would do anywhere else. That's our bottom line aspiration for every young person. That's our challenge to every young person too. So we support students, but we also challenge them. We challenge them in terms of their attitude towards learning, their willingness to take risks and make mistakes, recover from them, do things that they would have been uncomfortable with when they were introduced to them, whether that's you know, a complicated maths problem or abseiling down a cliff, whether that's taking part in a sports competition against other boroughs or whether or not it's travelling to France on a residential journey. A whole range of challenges. Because of the high quality of the teaching, learning and assessment and the very strong sense of belonging that students have, they make more rapid progress here than similar students or students with similar starting points do elsewhere and also generally speaking, that they would have done when they were younger, which kind of bucks the trend, because generally older students don't learn as quickly. We know this by comparing, if you like, the flight path of their learning when they arrive, compared to when they leave. It's not, we're not 100% successful in making everybody learn faster, if I can put it that way, but it's pretty close to it. Well, the school, runs from year 7 to year 12 and we have two classes in each of those year groups. We generally speaking have 11 students in those classes. It used to be 10 but there's a big pressure on places. So 
if you add all that up, you've got about 130 odd students in the school, just over. And in those classes, our core teaching and learning approach would be a teacher and a skilled teaching assistant. There may be additional support and intervention at other times from a pastoral support team or from a speech and language therapy or a speech language and communication needs teaching assistant or um, various other professionals. But to not oversell it, that's our model. Now that's very different than when our young people were in primary and perhaps they had a teaching assistant or a learning support assistant working alongside them for many hours of the day, um, dedicated to them or maybe to them or one other student. It's a very different model. And the reason for that is that increasingly, uh, as they develop, we want them to take greater ownership of their learning. And they do that by having the confidence to ask other students and talk about learning with other students and have, have adults guiding that learning through questioning rather than telling them what to do next. It's about developing their learning. So um, obviously that only works if you've got your learning pitched correctly for that learner from the teacher in the first place, but that is a feature of the school. We kind of call it the Goldilocks point, really. Yeah, the, the gap between where they are and where you want them to get to isn't too much, which means that they can't do it, isn't too little, which means they get bored, and it's just right. That's the idea to keep pulling. Um, we've got great teachers and teaching assistants working in the classroom, but their work is supported by a multidisciplinary team, uh, some of whom do work directly in the classroom or through intervention, but a lot of their work is actually in, in uh, teaching our staff, working with staff to improve our offer so that um, our approaches to teaching and learning are informed by the speech and language therapy service so that we, um, we have models of teaching that are informed by the students' needs so that we can, if you like, sweep everybody up in the universal before worrying about the specialised. Our universal offer is like the highly specialised offer elsewhere. So we have a significant amount of speech and language therapy time and a speech and language and communication needs teaching assistant we have some interventions in maths as well. We've got a pastoral support team that might focus in on students that, that uh, have having some difficulty regulating themselves in order to learn at, at different times. But wider than that, when we're talking about uh, physiotherapy, CAMs, occupational therapy, we do have access to those services. Some of those, there is about devising a program that is carried out home and school, some of them it's about professional and family liaison to support particular emotional or mental health needs. Uh, in school also we do have a counsellor and an art therapist as well, so that there is a range of provision that's designed to, to meet a whole, a whole range of needs that, if they're not met, interrupt or block learning. So. They're not interventions that, that uh, happen in isolation, They're, they happen for a purpose and that is to help that young person develop into a, a confident and engaged learner who can express not just what they've learned but their thoughts, views and feelings as well. Just like a secondary school in years 7 to 11, if you imagine this as a two-form entry school with smaller class sizes obviously than the mainstream school, our students are aware enough of themselves and the world around them to know those milestones so that in year seven you start secondary school, at the end of year nine something different happens, 
when you go into key stage four and people start talking about exams and courses and so on. So from 11 to 16, just like every school, all of our students make that journey unless they transfer to another school. And on occasion, it's right for uh, one of our students to transfer to a mainstream school and we would support that happening. Um, on, on other occasions it might be that actually it turns out we're not the best provision to meet that young person's needs and we need to positively work to, to um, make a change happen. Um, then, although this might seem a long way away for somebody choosing the school for secondary transfer, we have a sixth form provision which is almost the opposite way round to a mainstream sixth form. By that I mean that if we had a young person that was so confident and so clear and had enough support around them from family elsewhere that they knew they were wanting to and were ready to transfer full time to a further education setting or an apprenticeship that would be brilliant, we would celebrate that and, and through Key Stage 4 we would be lining up those pathways and options to make it happen. With the vast majority of our students, we're having the same conversations about aspirations, talents, what is needed and what demands you need to make of yourself to achieve your ambitions. But it doesn't really feel like a good step to go full time into somewhere unfamiliar. We, so we have one year in year 12 where three days a week typically students are here, continuing to work on a school based program that's got every element of a, of a post 16 study program from work experience to enterprise to maths, English, computing, personal social development, work skills, all of those things. But two days a week, they would be another provider that we, and by we I mean the school, the parents and carers, the careers advisor and the young person themselves have matched that young person's talents, uh, ambitions and direction. So they, they might go to a college, it might be an apprenticeship, it might be an IT training facility, it will be matched. To, to them. So during that year they're getting used to being somewhere else, somewhere different and, and that is quite a challenge. It makes transition much more successful. We track our students for years after they've left us and what we can see is that their attainment continues to progress and they continue to attend. That wasn't the picture before we had a sixth form. So it, it's very successful. So that ends at age 17. Occasionally we have someone that, that they and their parents know that what they need to, to do is to move from here to someone that runs to the age of 19 and, and not make another jump. And of course that is a, another option to explore. But the vast majority of our students do stay into year 12 and leave at the age of 17. So, um, I'm often asked what to Ofsted say about the school. Um, I'm in the very fortunate position of, of saying I believe Ofsted have got it right with us. We became one of the first outstanding schools in the country in 2005. And because we're a special school, we continue to have uh, scheduled inspections unlike mainstream schools and we've had three subsequent outstanding inspections, uh, the most recent one being in 2018, and in each of those they detail the further improvement that the school has made, because we're not content to be the best we can be at that point. Our focus is on improvement. If, I kind of think the choice is between improving or stagnating, really. I don't think you can stay the same. So we will continue to improve, we will continue to make mistakes to be honest with you and we'll continue to not get things quite right because we're human. But the, the
broad picture is that the quality of what we provide Ofsted say is um, outstanding I guess is, is their, their word for it so it, it's very very good but we're not complacent there's always room for improvement and part of that improvement comes from needing to adapt to the new needs of young people as they arrive with us but we don't see Ofsted as a threat in fact we don't do anything to try and impress Ofsted we try and do what we believe to be right and in the interest of our learners it seems to have paid off so far parents often ask about transport to and from school but that is a local authority decision rather than a school decision and a local authority provision so the application process runs through them if you're going to apply for homeschool transport, I would advise you to do it before your child starts so that you can get the support of the professionals, including the school, that currently work with your child. So if there's any evidence needed, whether it's about medical need or about um, that other siblings need to be in different places at the same time, you can get all of that done before the young person starts. It's harder to apply later. Um, part of our job though, it might seem frightening, it, it depending, you know, if, you're, if you're applying for a secondary transfer place, it might appear frightening to start talking about independent travel training, but by the time the young person leaves, we, the school, and I'm sure you, the parents and carers, want that young person to be as independent as possible. That means they need to understand about uh, how to negotiate public transport, they need to understand routes, maps, they need to understand them to keep themselves safe, they need to understand what to do if something goes wrong on the journey. And our independent travel training programme is targeted to students when they're ready to learn a plan. It's not the same as saying they're ready to start travelling independently, but when they're ready to learn about those things. To be honest, we think that's uh, the case often slightly before the parent does. Um, so we do have a bit of a discussion about that. But we support that young person to develop the skills to travel independently. Uh, we don't do it by any fixed benchmark. You know, for example, by the end of year nine, year 9 or year 8 or wherever it is, all students will be travelling independently. Because that doesn't make sense. But we do want it to happen as soon as possible so that by the time we get to work experience and um, taking part in events in the community that as many young people as possible have got the skills to do that. If you are interested in, in your child coming here, I get asked two questions. One is how do I do that and the other is is the school oversubscribed? I'll do my best always to be straight with parents. The school is always oversubscribed. That shouldn't stop you doing what you believe is in the best interest of your child, obviously. So, um, the local authority where you live has the responsibility for placing students with EHC plans. Every student here has an EHC plan. If you're in Hackney, the local authority has a range of special schools that it sees as meeting the, the range of likely needs of students. So they will have a view about whether or not we're likely to meet your child's needs or not. But if you express a preference for us, they will consult with us and I will respond. If you're living in a borough outside of Hackney, the process is exactly the same, except that that authority also has to consult with Hackney Education. So it's the same process, as far as you're concerned. You express your preference and the authority consults. I have to respond to those consultations within a fixed time, 
sometimes we might need to get more information and, and then I'll give a straight answer about whether or not I believe we can meet that young person's needs. All I can advise you to do is to follow that process and um, it, it may it may be difficult because it might be that an authority says, well, actually, we've got, we've got a school in our own authority that we think could meet needs there, and it, it would cost us a lot more money to send them to store and help us because of the transport, etc. They're all conversations at a local authority level. I receive a consultation from the local authority and I, and I give a response to it. That's what I have to do in law, and I'll do it fairly. We do have a lot of applications. And we have more applications than we have places. But again, if you don't try to get in clearly, you won't. Uh, so I appreciate the very difficult time for parents. Um, choosing a school is very stressful for any parent. If you're a parent of a, a child with complex special educational needs, it's probably a double whammy. And uh, so you, you have my sympathy, you'll get a straight answer from me to any consultation that comes my way. Other than that, good luck.